this video has been a journey. Like, it's, it's been a process, we'll say. That's why I'm not in uniform. I wasn't planning to record this. I made one of the simplest and stupidest mistakes I have ever made while working on an art piece. And the piece is finished already, so I, like, I can't fix it without putting, like, I don't know, maybe another three to four hours into it. And I don't have the time to do that because this video needs to come out. <laughs> you know what, I'll let future Drake, who's, you know, in uniform and put together and has a script, really describe what's happening and what the problem is. What really ticks me off about it is I made the exact same mistake last week. Hey y'all, I'm Drake and this is Drake Makes Art. So last week I put out a video where I took wavelengths of light and converted them to frequencies of sound. So for this week I thought it would be fun to try and go the other way and take frequencies of sound and turn them into wavelengths of light. With the ultimate goal being that I want to take a piece of music and create a work of art out of it. You know, I want to take a song and translate that into a visual piece. And at the start of the process, things actually went pretty well. The first problem I had to figure out was how do I take the auditory spectrum and scale it down into the visual spectrum? If you've seen the last video in this series, you know that when I was going from light to sound, I just scaled everything up by a factor of 10 to the 12th. Unfortunately, I can't do that going back the other way because even if I did scale everything down, there would still be large areas on either side of the visual spectrum where the scaled frequencies would be outside the range of what we can see. So this is where we get to the first lesson I learned while making this video, how to normalize scales. Scale normalization is a statistical process that takes all of your values and scales them down so that they're between 0 and 1. And it's perfect for situations like this where you have data across ranges that aren't analogous to each other. You do it with this formula, which is x minus x min over x max minus x min equals x prime, with x prime being your new value between 0 and 1. And if we do a little algebra and change our minimum and maximum to match the visible spectrum, we can turn our sound waves into light waves. Now, at first I did this normalization over a 9 octave range using a list of notes ranging from 0 to B8, which is essentially the entire auditory spectrum. But once I did that, I realized I didn't like the way colors were placed on the spectrum. And the reason for this is that I didn't think to account for the way the space between frequencies changes as you move up the pitch scale. Here's what I mean by that. Every octave on the pitch scale has 11 semitones. Every time you go up an octave, the frequency of the pitch doubles. So for example, the jump from C0 to C1 is roughly 11.35 hertz. And from C1 to C2 is 32.7 hertz. Then to C3 is 65.4 hertz, and so on and so on until you get to the very top of the range where the jump from C8 to C9 is 4,186 hertz. Now because each of these jumps covers an octave, there are still 11 semitones inside each octave jump, whether that jump is only 16 hertz or over 4,000 hertz. So as you go up the pitch scale, the frequencies get more spread out, which means that when I normalized everything and converted the wavelengths of light, the vast majority of my pitches ended up inside the violet color range, and all the other colors combined only made up 25% of the pitch range. So to remedy this problem, I decided that instead of scaling the entire auditory spectrum, I'd limit the range of pitches only to those included in the musical piece I decided to base this artwork on. So the lowest note in the song would be the shortest wavelength of light, and the highest note would be the longest wavelength of light. Hey, it's Future Drake here. So what I just said shouldn't make sense because this is the big mistake I mentioned at the top of this video. In theory, higher pitches mean shorter wavelengths and lower pitches mean longer wavelengths. I just said the opposite because I made a mistake when I went to normalize my scales. So what I should have done was I should have converted from frequency to wavelength in the auditory spectrum and then normalized that scale and converted to wavelengths in the visual spectrum. What I did instead was I just normalized the frequency scale and converted directly to wavelengths. 
The problem with this is that now my lowest wavelengths are analogous to my lowest frequencies. And in reality, the inverse is true, where the lowest wavelengths are equal to the highest frequencies. I know this is getting a little like technical and wibbly wobbly. What it basi what I'm what I'm basically saying is that my spectrum is flipped. If I had done it correctly, the lowest notes would be red and the highest notes would be violet. Instead, the lowest notes are violet and the highest notes are red. So essentially the image is it's not inverted, but it's backwards <laughs> um, from a color standpoint. Sorry about that. <laughs> the worst thing about all this is that I literally made the exact same mistake last week in last week's video where I told you that the longest wavelength of light that we can see is 380 nanometers when really it's 750. Apparently I'm just really bad at mixing up the ends of the visual, visual spectrum. Like I'm just, I don't know. I mean I do still have to ch like do the little L thing to see which way is left and which way is right so maybe Maybe it's just a thing in my brain. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, back to the video. So now the big question I have to answer is what song am I going to use for this art piece? You know, do I want to do something, you know, kind of classical? Do I want to do like Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata or Bach's Goldberg variations? And I was thinking about all this and I had a moment where I was like, Drake, don't be an idiot. There is only one right answer to this question. I mean, there's just no other option, right? So first I had to scroll through the score to find the highest and lowest notes so I could set the range for my frequency scale. Then I put the scale through the normalization process and came out with a wavelength of light to correspond for each pitch on the pitch scale. Was it still weighted a little bit towards violet? Yes. But it was a lot better than when I normalized over the entire pitch scale. Is there some way I could have accounted for this? Probably. But I'm not a statistician, and I was already nursing a little bit of a migraine at this point, and it's about to get worse. So now that I have a wavelength for each pitch, I can start on the artwork, right? Wrong. Most of the paints your average artist has access to aren't spectral, meaning they only reflect one wavelength of light. So if I'm going to come anywhere close to creating a faithful representation of these colors, I'm going to have to do this digitally. Also, doing it digitally gives me a little bit more control over the colors because I can modify them like mathematically with sliders, which presents a problem because now I have to convert all these colors into sRGB. Why? Because sRGB is the standard color space for digital screens and displays. If you're watching this video on any kind of electronic device, like a phone or a TV, all the colors you're seeing are in the sRGB color space. This is the second big lesson I got from this video, and to really understand it, we're going to have to have a little bit of a history lesson and take a light foray into color science. Stay with me. So, back in 1931, the International Commission on Illumination, which is a thing, apparently, put together this diagram that shows all the possible colors anyone could ever see. That's it. That's all of them. Like, all of them. Now, even though this is a two-dimensional graph, the actual color space exists in three dimensions. That's why there's some warping at the upper left you can see. And every point on this graph, every color, has its own unique set of x, y, z coordinates. Now, if you take a closer look at this graph, you'll see that this horseshoe shape has tick marks with numbers all around the edge. And these are actually wavelengths of light, because this horseshoe actually represents the visible spectrum. So there's a specific set of XYZ coordinates that correspond to each spectral wavelength. And luckily for me, the CIE released a table that lists those coordinates back in 1964. So I transcribed the table into Google Sheets and started trying to figure out how to convert these coordinates to sRGB. Now, I'm going to gloss over a lot of the nuances of how this actually works because it gave me a headache and I had over a week to figure it out. I want you to enjoy this video. I don't want you to get a headache. So. I'm going to be a little hand wavy here. The short version is that you can define smaller color spaces inside the CIE XYZ color space by defining a white point and three primaries. Like there are several ways to do it, but sRGB does it by defining a white space and three primaries. If you do a little bit of matrix math with the XYZ coordinates of those four points, you can create a matrix that 
when multiplied by any given set of x, y, z coordinates, will give you a red, a green, and a blue value that you can then scale to be between 0 and 255. And that scaled number is the number you use if you're using like RGB sliders that you find in Photoshop or Illustrator. If you want to make things super easy for you, like I did, you take that scaled number, convert it to a hexadecimal number, and then have your spreadsheet software, uh, I think the word is concatenate, it's, it was some function I'd never heard of, but you can basically combine strings with it, like combine them together to create the hex code for the color that you need. Also, I just want to take a second and acknowledge again that yes this is very hand wavy of me just being like oh I did the stuff and let the, <laughs> the math is there. If you would like a full workup on how all of this works like let me know in the comments and maybe I'll do it. If enough people are like hey I want you to explain color science for me sure I'll do it. Um, but in the meantime I will leave a link in the description to a very helpful forum post that helps me with all of this and a website run by a guy named Bruce Lindblom. I have no idea who you are, but you are a legend. Thank you so much. And hopefully that will give you a good starting point if this is something that you're interested in. So now that I have the RGB hex codes for the colors that most closely approximate every wavelength of light on the visible spectrum, I can finally start the process of turning over the rainbow into a work of art. First I had to go through measure by measure and beat by beat and transcribe the music into scientific pitch notation, because that's the scale I used for normalization. Then I took each pitch and turned it into a color using the hex codes I created. Then came the tricky part. I had to decide how I wanted to arrange the blocks of color I'd be creating to best capture the music it originated from. Like a lot of popular songs written during the 20th century, Over the Rainbow was written in 32 bar form which means it has a short 4-bar intro, two 8-bar verses, an 8-bar bridge, and a final 8-bar verse, before another 8-bar ending. Yes, that's more than 32 bars, I know, but if you take off the intro and the ending, there's 32 bars in the middle. And that section actually repeats based on the sheet music that I'm using. So to preserve the integrity of the music, I decided to break the song up along the boundaries of these sections, including the repeat in the middle, to create 10 horizontal rectangles. Then I broke the rectangles up by beat and started the long process of coloring them one cell at a time. Because when you're listening to music you'll often hear multiple notes played together at the same time, I decided to stack five layers of these rectangles to account for the biggest chords in the piece. When I finished, I decided I'd turn the blend mode for the layers to linear dodge, or add, since RGB is an additive color space, and see what happened. finished filling in all the cells, I tried to change the blend mode in Illustrator, but it just didn't look right. So I did a little research and realized the blend mode I was using, Color Dodge, worked differently than the Linear Dodge I was used to using in Photoshop. And Linear Dodge isn't available in Illustrator, so I exported each layer individually, took them all into Photoshop, and blended them the right way. I experimented with both a white and a black background, and in the end I decided to create a diptych with both. So what do you think? Is it what you expected? I honestly didn't know what to expect when I started this project. In the middle after I did the normalization, I kind of had this moment of like, oh no, it's going to be overweighted towards purple. But I actually really like the colors here. I think there's a good diversity of color. I mean, there's, there's obviously a lot of magenta and purple, but there's also some yellows and even a few white and gray areas, and I was not expecting that at all. I figured everything would be weighted towards the primaries. And like, 
I'm kind of surprised that this actually looks pleasant. Like, it kind of looks like a decent piece of op art. I think I'm going to have to do another one. I mean, I, I, I made the mistake and inverted the spectrum, and so I think I'm going to have to do another one to, like, correct that mistake. Also, now that I, like, know what I'm doing, I think I could probably knock this out a little bit faster than last time and with much fewer headaches. So if you've enjoyed this video, let me know in the comments. Let me know if there's a piece that you want me to turn into a work of art like this. Send me your songs. Also, hopefully I'll find a way to account for the way harmonics work so that everything's not overweighted towards red, because when I flip the spectrum, red will be the one that's overweighted. Thank you so much for watching. If you feel like I've earned it, then please subscribe to this channel for more content like this. For all the headaches this video gave me, I feel like I have learned so much, and I think this might be the most fun I've had making an art piece in a very long time. So uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time when we make something new. Bye. Thank you.